Hello and welcome. Uh, thanks to all of you that have dialed in from around the world. And this is our uh, first scheduled session as part of our virtual queue protect and archive event. My name is Eric Basier. I run product and technical marketing here at Quantum. And this session is focused on something that our CEO, Jamie, actually just talked about. And it's around uh, preparing for a future where 80% of the data is unstructured. Um, I think that uh, we'll, we'll, use, we'll talk about some examples of this unstructured data, but I would say that there is increasing uh, I would say consensus very broadly within the industry that uh, this is what the future is going to look like. And I think for uh, those of us working in IT, it has some profound implications for how we have to think about our storage infrastructures and the management of that data. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q&A function on the WebEx. Uh, we, uh, I will be taking questions at the end, so please use that function and um, we'll, we'll go through this presentation and then uh, take some questions. So as, as Jamie said in, in his keynote, uh, it's, it's widely expected that over the next few years, 80% of all the data on the planet is going to be unstructured. Uh, there are a number of different statistics about this from different analysts. Um, there's been some different studies that also indicate unstructured data is growing at a rate of somewhere between 40 to 50 percent a year. Uh, I think, if anything, the COVID pandemic will be an accelerant for them. Now, the, the biggest subset of unstructured data is video and images. And this slide is showing some of the different use cases for that. Uh, clearly, video itself used for entertainment purposes, for communication purposes, and even for surveillance is, you know, the biggest and largest subset of all the data in the world. So video surveillance, as an example, is the number one data generator in the world. And we've noticed in our business, corporations in every industry are using video more for marketing purposes, right, to, to promote their brand, um, maybe to engage with people on social media channels and things like that, but also for uh, internal training and internal communication. I think, you know, we believe that video will be, yeah, it is already the most predominant form of communication and probably the most effective form of communication. So clearly video is a big piece of kind of what um, this data is, is going to be comprised of in the future. But there's a lot of examples of this that are, you know, not specific to um, media for entertainment purposes, right, or video for entertainment purposes. Um, for any of our customers out there that are in the various fields of healthcare, scientific research, um, medical imaging, medical records, genomics, um, microscopy, these fields generate data where they're generating a huge amount of data, very large files, and there tend to be common characteristics of what's needed, uh, which we'll, we'll, get, we'll get more into some of those details, some of the requirements of the infrastructure for that. I mentioned corporate video. You know, it's used for training, it's used for communication, it's also used to promote brands. Many of the largest brands in the world uh, create a large amount of video and high-res image content to promote their brand. And then surveillance, and surveillance we'll talk about briefly, but um, it's not really, it's not just being used for security anymore. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of our partners, and, you know, in some cases the responsibility uh, for the surveillance infrastructure in retail rolls up to a chief revenue officer right? because surveillance footage and the analysis of that footage is being used to make decisions to help drive revenue. So video as a source of insight and um, I think is increasingly common. Uh, of course, otherwise every one of us knows surveillance is everywhere, um, airports, gaming, any type of critical infrastructure. And with smart cities and some of the things that are coming around 5G and the interconnectedness of all of these um, IoT devices, 
it's going to generate a huge amount of content that will talk more about what's required there. And then I think there's fields of machine learning. And I think this is in almost every industry, there's different examples of this, but you know, financial analytics, manufacturing, um, ADAS, which is automated driver assistance systems, research. This is a really interesting and emerging field that will generate a huge amount of this unstructured data that, like all of these examples, really needs to be preserved and protected forever. And then, of course, governments around the world, both at the federal level, at the state, the, the county, and the local level, is generating a lot of this type of data as well. Um, many of our customers over the years are capturing huge amounts of satellite imagery that's used to either study the planet, used for environmental purposes, used for defense and intelligence purposes. And so I, I wanted to provide some examples of this unstructured data growth across a number of industries. The other thing we see that's more horizontal in nature that is kind of something we're seeing in any industry, any vertical, it, those are listed along the bottom. I mean, some people think of this and refer to it as big data analytics or a big data practice. People talk about data lakes cold storage for archive, and of course, data protection and backup. And I think all of these use cases are relevant for unstructured data and apply across every industry that we serve. And not only is this type of data prevalent everywhere, I know that for those that are dealing with this, you know, we we find that this unstructured data is typically um, at the center of our customer's business. And I know for all of us that deal with data storage and data management, that's not a surprise. Um, there's a very strong correlation between this type of data and the mission of the company or the organization, right? Um, some examples here from a number of different uh, research is uh, um, a number of different types of research that have been done over the last few years. So kind of starting at the bottom, actually. Um, smart factories generating one terabyte of data per day. What we see with some of our customers in manufacturing is um, machines on the manufacturing floor are generating high-res images for QA purposes, right? For example, um, to look at and compare the quality of a particular um, silicone wafer, let's say, as compared to a gold master. And with, as with many of these things we'll talk about, this data needs to be kept for, in some cases, forever, certainly for decades. And the, the, the storage period is not driven by, you know, compliance or, or regulatory purposes. It's really driven by, you know, in this case, how long do they need to keep that um, manufacturing QA data in the event that, you know, they ever have um, a, a field epidemic failure or something like that, and they have to go back and study it and analyze it, right? Um, Earth observation systems, 20 to 30 terabytes per day. Um, commercial jets with some of the sensors and things that are on there, 30, 20 terabytes per hour, right? And, and it, it goes on. So the, the scale of this data is increasing, but it is also really at the core of what's driving the digital transformation of many of our customers um, in, in, in all industries. And if we kind of abstract and just talk more about this data itself, kind of the challenges around it, um, first off is, you know, it's orders of magnitude larger than an average corporate database. Um, and one of the ways that, you know, this manifests itself as Companies usually have data that's growing much faster than their storage budget. And they also are struggling to protect this data. I mean, that is two of the things we see very commonly with these types of data sets. That's kind of how it starts. People will say, hey, I've been used to managing, you know, 50 terabytes of databases and VMware, and, you know, I've got my Oracle environment, VMware, and, you know, I'm, I'm good. Now, all of a sudden, I'm dealing with hundreds of terabytes of geospatial data or hundreds of terabytes of high-res images coming off the manufacturing line, right? Um, it's, it's very costly to move all of this data to the cloud. 
and it's impractical in some ways too. It's, it's very costly just because the raw cost of storing it in the cloud, but also the logistical challenges of, of moving it to the cloud. Really the bigger cost driver there though is this type of data needs to be analyzed periodically. And it's like I've heard many customers say, it's the data itself is not valuable until it is. In many cases, the access patterns of how this data would need to be analyzed or retrieved is unpredictable. And so the um, large egress fees that are, um, you know, uh, in terms of removing data from the public cloud or retrieving data from the public cloud, those can add up very quickly. And one of the things we've seen in our, our business over the years is most enterprise IT storage products, most enterprise storage products were designed for structured data sets. And they've built a really rich set of data services in their software that are great for a database, they're great for VMware, they just don't apply for these forms of unstructured data. I mean, you cannot compress high-res images. You cannot compress video. You can't dedupe it. Snapping it, you have to treat that differently. Um, replicating it, backing it up with a batch backup technique, um, it, video and large images and other forms of unstructured data require a different set of data services, including things like erasure encoding and some things like that. And um, the last thing about it is it's very complex to search and analyze. Uh, when we think about searching and analyzing a database, for example, through queries, it's columns of, you know, it's rows and columns. Uh, that problem has more or less been solved. Um, when we think about how do we search for a specific uh, pattern or image within a set of pixels, you know, on a, a high-res image or something like that, or um, looking through and analyzing millions of MRI images, as some of our customers are doing uh, today to kind of um, study and combat diseases. That's an incredibly difficult problem. It also means that there's a big opportunity there for us and for other vendors to kind of build software that makes this easier. And so, in general, these are some of the characteristics of the unstructured data that we see. The second thing is that because this data is at the core of the mission of many of the, the companies we serve, most of it will be preserved and protected forever. And if we look at the, the life cycle of this data, um, first is that it, it, uh, in, in every industry, we tend to follow a common life cycle. Um, first is that uh, the content is created and uploaded at some type of an edge environment. And the second thing is, it, it, almost all cases, the data is created by some type of a machine. Um, and so this is why many companies are, they refer to a lot of this as the IoT or Internet of Things. I mean, these are devices that are connected to the Internet and they're just producing so much more of this data than a human being could generate. Right? That's one of, the, one of the drivers of growth here. There's a stage in the life cycle of this unstructured data where it requires very high speed ingest, uh, processing, classification, analysis. And at that stage, there's typically, you know, highly skilled, highly paid employees that are working on that data. They need to use that data for collaboration purposes. They collaborate and they produce some finished product. Um, in the case of research, this might be a research paper. In the case of um, you know, making a movie, they finish a movie and distribute it. In the case of a training department within a large bank, for example, um, they produce a series of training videos that are required for compliance reasons and they distribute that out to employees. And then there's a stage where the data needs to be preserved and protected forever. And here's where the characteristics of the storage are fundamentally different. Um, massive scale, we're talking tens to hundreds of petabytes or larger, uh, highly durable so that it is a protected archive, right? Because you cannot back up hundreds of petabytes of data 
over the network. You just can't do it. The data itself needs to be stored in a protected way. And because of the scale of this data, um, cost becomes a, a huge driver just to make it viable. And we do see that object storage and erasure encoding will play a key role here. We also believe that tape is going to play an increasingly important role for the cold storage of these large unstructured data sets. And if you look at the portfolio that, that Quantum's built, you know, as we focus on leading the world in video and unstructured data solutions, we've built a portfolio of products and solutions that really align to this type of a uh, use case. And starting from the left to right, we've got our in-vehicle and edge storage products designed for capturing data at the edge in mobile and, you know, remote kind of ruggedized environments. We've got our high-performance uh, storage systems where we really have two different sets of product lines here focused on different use cases and different workloads. Our Stornext scale-out file storage product line with NVMe and disk-based storage is really for very large unstructured data sets where fast streaming, reliability, and uh, scale are critically important. And this is deployed in mission-critical environments around the world. We also have a new line of products designed specifically for video surveillance. And I'll, I'll just give you, a, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then on the, on the right, we have our active scale object storage systems for very large scale online archives with the best durability in the world, the easiest object store to manage at scale. And of course, our longtime leadership in tape where, you know, we think that tape will play a critical role in the infrastructures of tomorrow, but it's not necessarily about backup. It's about long-term archive, long-term storage of these big unstructured data sets, which is really where tape shines. So we've, we've built a portfolio that aligns against the, the needs and the requirements of the market. And when you look at the portfolio that we've built in a more abstract way, you can see that we have technologies that can meet any combination of performance and cost, and we can deploy those um, with our customers in a way that meets the needs of their specific use case. And if I just explain the chart, you've got performance on the y-axis there, you've got cost uh, on the x, and so all the way from the very fastest storage with our Stornext uh, NVMe storage, what we call our F-series, to our disk-based storage, all the way down to the lowest cost storage in tape, and everything in between, including our active scale object storage, we have technologies that can meet any uh, criteria required in terms of performance, cost, and scale. We also, and, and many of our customers in I would say in the enterprise IT space, probably know us more for backup and archive, but our Stornext scale-out file storage product line is actually deployed pretty widely for these large unstructured data sets already. And we have very good integration and data management capabilities between highest performance NVMe storage to object storage to public cloud object stores and even tape. I mean, that's one of the things that really sets Stornext apart. So again, really I would say a portfolio focused on large unstructured data sets. If we look a little more specifically at what a typical use case would look like here, and we have more sessions that go into more detail on all of these, but um, Typically, what we would see in terms of our customers in enterprise IT is petabytes of unstructured data growing by 40 to 50 percent a year. I mean, if you're out there and if you have that, you know, let's, let's talk. Um, I, I joke sometimes that, you know, a petabyte of data isn't what it used to be. I mean, it used to be, you know, many years ago when I was out talking to customers, it was somewhat rare to talk to a customer that had a petabyte of data. I mean, it was there. Now it's just very common. And typically what I find when I ask about characterizing that data is 
A small subset of it is structured. You know, it's more typical corporate data. It's a database, it's ERP, it's, you know, VMware, Hyper-V, it's some, you know, that kind of thing. The majority of the data is some form of unstructured data. Um, often the pain point someone might express, it's, it's twofold, is the data is just growing way faster than their storage budget. And then the second thing is just, it's too big to back up. And then typically what we would deploy is something with our Stornext scale out file storage, which uh, is powered by our Stornext file system software. That's kind of the software that holds this all together. Uh, and then we can create a solution or a storage infrastructure for this unstructured data that uses any combination of um, on-premise storage in the public cloud, uh, object storage, and even tape, or any combination thereof. And we have policy engines built into Stornext that will allow you, uh, you as an administrator or as an IT leader to manage where your storage goes, to manage where your data grows. And so increasingly, we're, we are seeing this, you know, be deployed as part of a kind of a hybrid cloud solution for large unstructured data sets. And I think often when I talk with prospects or, or customers outside of media and entertainment, I think there is a perception that Quantum's portfolio is very widely deployed in media and entertainment, which it is, but it's, it's not really deployed outside of that. It's not relevant outside of that. And this slide shows, these are just the public, published case studies we have for storing and protecting large unstructured data sets outside of media and entertainment, right? Now, media and entertainment has very similar sets of requirements, right? I mean, they have the high speed requirements, they have the need to keep that data and that content forever, and so does surveillance, right? There's a very similar set of characteristics, but here we see a, a huge set of examples of uh, universities, research institutions, government agencies, and you know, many more that are just different forms of unstructured data that have a need for very high speed ingest at that stage. It's data that's created by a machine. It needs to be analyzed, processed, and then eventually needs to be stored and preserved and protected forever, you know, in many cases forever. And when you look at this list, the data sets that we're storing and managing are central to the mission of all of these organizations, right? So we're, you see a common, some common themes as we look at, you know, preparing for a future where 80% of your data is unstructured. Uh, we're seeing some common themes across all of these industries. Now I wanna just give a preview of some of the other sessions and look at our solutions for two specific use cases related to video, okay? And this is a large subset of all the unstructured data out there. Now, for many of the audience here, um, you are somewhere in the field of enterprise IT, you're a CIO, you're a, a VP of IT, director of IT. You may not have direct responsibility for, let's say, corporate video or video surveillance, but I do think it's important for you to know uh, to be educated on this, and I think we will see in the future more crossover for sure between the enterprise IT department and some of these other departments that are creating video, um, which we'll talk about. So um, for corporate video, um, this has been, you know, we're one of the leaders here, and this has been one of the fastest growing segments of our business. And corporate video shows up for training purposes, for marketing purposes, for communication purposes. And I think for any of us that, you know, live with a digital smartphone and everything, this is pretty intuitive. I mean, video is being used more and more and more. So here the use case actually looks pretty similar to what we might deploy for um, other very large unstructured data sets. We use our um, Stornext, scale out file storage product line with NVMe for that tier one production storage, very high speed ingest, and you have a number of these uh, professionals that then um, collaborate on that data, right? Create some finished product. And we actually will do rendering, we'll do analytics, you know, all these different processes on top of that very high speed storage. 
Um, once the data is finished, distributed, once the work is finished and distributed, it, it's archived and, and stored either on object storage tape or the public cloud. And so again, it looks very similar to what we would deploy for many of these other large unstructured data sets. This happens to be one where we have a lot of expertise and customers, and we do have one additional session uh, today and tomorrow that's covering this. The second thing is the new portfolio that we have for surveillance and physical security. This was something that we announced the initial part of last year, and we made an announcement in March to significantly uh, broaden this. So we now have a full line of NVRs or network video recorders. We have a line of HCI products purpose-built for surveillance and uh, physical security where you want to store multiple uh, workloads on that product. We have lines of analytics and um, uh, GPU-based analytics and application servers specifically tailored for the applications in the space. And then, of course, very large-scale surveillance archives that we can deploy using a combination of object storage and our file storage. So when you look at this, we now have one of the broadest portfolios for physical security out there. And last but not least, and, and critical to, uh, and really the focus of this event, are solutions for data protection and archive. And I think as we head into this year, Quantum's portfolio for backup and archive, for protection and archive, is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, we're building on our longtime leadership uh, in tape. Um, we've, of course, for many years, we've had our um, high-speed uh, backup appliances, our DXI product line, really for that structured data sets, and we're talking more about that over the next couple days. And then with the recent acquisition of the active scale object store line from Western Digital, we can now bring any combination of these products and technologies to bear when it comes to solving your, your problems around data protection and archive. And I think that's really it, it's kind of regardless of the type of data. You know, I mean, if, if we're talking about storing and protecting massive unstructured data sets where 80% of the data in the world is going to look like that, we'll bring certain technologies to bear for your databases, for your virtual environments, we, we're going to protect that and store it using different techniques. So I hope that you have a sense of both some of the challenges around unstructured data in terms of where the, the, um, the data sphere is going and what it's going to look like. And I hope you also have a good sense of all the technologies and solutions Quantum has um, to, to help solve the problem. If you would like to learn more, um, obviously go to quantum.com, but we do have a specific asset that we've worked with IDC on. It is called Storage System Considerations in the Digital Era. Um, I'm showing the URL here on the slide, so if you want to uh, learn more about what I talked about, I think this is a very good resource on quantum.com. And with that, um, I'll open it up for questions on the chat line. And uh, again, if you want to learn more about anything that I've talked about here, um, go to our website, quantum.com. So let me take a look and see what questions have come in. So one question is, um, if we could talk a little bit more about, uh, the, the, the question is basically saying, um, this individual doesn't know much about Stornext. Can we talk a little bit more about what Stornext is? So. Um, uh, Stornext is uh, a file system, and Stornext is a scale-out file system. So it's something that we've been offering for, um, I think, over 15 years. So it's a very high-speed file system, and it's got um, the ability to have very, very fast streaming performance. Um, it can be deployed on a combination of NVMe storage, disk-based storage, and we also have a very sophisticated uh, data management or policy engine built into that software so that we can move data between those tiers of storage, NVMe and disk, object, tape, and cloud. Um, so we do see that Stornext is really, it's, it's really used for use cases that require the highest levels of streaming performance 
um, high reliability, and then obviously scale. Uh, and if you are interested in learning more about Stornex, reach out to your local quantum representative. Um, let's see, question about, I think this last slide that I showed, uh, just talking about kind of some of the different use cases for this. So, um, one, of the, one of the reasons we drew this picture the way we drew it is we're, we're trying to show the scale of what we can do. And for many of our customers, when they're thinking about protecting structured data sets or if they're using a more traditional, um, you know, one of these backup applications to protect their data, um, that's where often we would deploy our DXI backup appliances. So as it says here, these are really designed to allow customers to meet their backup SLAs, meet their security requirements, and also provide that high-speed backup repository um, and then the quick recovery. Uh, one of our partners that is participating in this virtual queue Protect and Archive event is Veeam. I think many of you are probably familiar with Veeam. And in the case of a Veeam backup environment, we have really good integration with DXI. We would use the DXI as a backup repository for high-speed backup and instant VM recovery. And we really see then tape's role in that case being about an air-gapped copy or an air-gapped solution to protect data against ransomware and malware. Now, object is something that is a little more emerging, but I think in the realm of, um, you know, within the, the backup applications and those environments that we sell into, I often say object is the new tape. You know, many companies are looking to either consolidate tape or even consolidate SANS and, you know, use object storage as that large data lake, that secondary storage data lake. And kind of as shown here in the picture, I mean, we have many customers that, you know, may be directly storing some of this unstructured data on an object store, but also backing data up to that same object store. You know, an object storage really shines in that type of an environment where you can have multiple applications. So, um, the, this question was a little more just, you know, talk more about DXI. So, that gives you a sense. We are also doing um, additional sessions on every one of these products and solutions, and so make sure to attend that. We do have a session focused on um, meeting your SLAs while reducing backup spend, and that really is focused more on DXI. Okay, and um, let's see. Um, question about the uh, GPU servers I mentioned. So these are specific to um, the surveillance line. The question is, do those really compete with NVIDIA? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, they are, um, we, it's a, uh, we do use, well, sorry, I'll start again. It is an appliance that is, um, I think there's six GPU cards in there. I don't know what brand of GPUs we use, but um, this would be used for, um, you know, surveillance analytics at scale. And where we're focusing that product line is really with um, some of the leading surveillance analytics applications like BriefCam. Um, so I guess in some sense, maybe it could, but I, I think it's more, you know, we would look for partnership opportunities there. And, you know, I, I didn't talk about, I, I guess I didn't talk about GPU-based analytics too much, but, um, you know, within, um, let's see if I can find it. You know, within this type of a use case, you know, we have many customers that are using um, NVIDIA GPU servers to analyze data that is stored in Storenext. Um, and so, you know, I think that's an area where we can partner and, um, uh, and I, I, and there, you know, there's different use cases for that. I was just thinking the other, uh, one of the other uh, partners that we have presenting with us here at Virtual Queue Protect and Archive is WEC.io, and um, they have some good solutions in this space as well, and some markets that we don't focus in, and they actually also have some good 
uh, ways that they partner with NVIDIA. So um, for those out there kind of doing things with GPUs, for sure give us a call and we can figure out the right solution for you there. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for the questions. Uh, we are a, a few minutes past. Um, let's see, uh, one more. Um, Yeah, good good question here. The question is, um, uh, when it comes to hybrid backups, uh, the, the 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 question is basically saying hybrid backups. A customer that has both structured and unstructured data, would we use multiple systems, or would we use sort of a traffic cop to determine the target? Typically today, um, we would use different systems and. Um, what I would think about, and this depends on your environment, but what I would think about in this use case would be the backup application itself may be that traffic cop. And that is something that we have deployed in many, many customers around the world. So, you know, you might be using Veeam, and Veeam is basically saying, you, you know, you create a backup policy that goes to a high speed backup repository. You create a different backup policy that goes to an offline copy to protect against ransomware. And maybe you have a third copy that goes to a cloud-based storage tier. You know, and that could be an object store, it could be, you know, public cloud. But in that context, the backup application would really be the traffic cop. Um, now we have other use cases where if someone is using the Stornext file system as their primary storage, as shown here, in that case, Stornext is kind of the traffic cop in the way that you are asking about. So in this case, once a file is stored on the file system, there's a policy that can be set to that file. And Stornext actually is managing the metadata, right? Our file system is managing that metadata, the, the catalog, and we can move that file to different types of storage based on um, your needs. So one of the common policies that we might see is a file is written to Stornext and the administrator would say, keep one copy here locally on fast disk, but maybe go ahead and make one copy to Glacier. And then you have that offsite copy. Right? Or, you know, you may have a different policy that says keep everything on fast disk or NVMe, but then once, um, once I hit a threshold of, let's say, 80% or something like that in my fast disk, move the oldest files off to a slow tier, tape, let's say, or Glacier if you want, right, or an object store. Uh, Stornex will manage those policies, and when we, when we, truncate that data, we call that truncation. If we move it, whether we're making a copy or whether we actually just move it, one of the great things that it does is it preserves that file system presentation for clients and for servers and others that are using that, um, that data. So um, it is a pretty sophisticated data management engine. So it, this may be a use case where, you know, a customer is, ingesting satellite data directly to a Stornex file system, and it's really primary storage, and then they're using Stornex as their data protection mechanism, which we do through multiple or triple copies. Does that make sense? So in this use case, Stornex might be the traffic cop. There's plenty of other use cases more like this, where if you're using a backup application, that really is gonna be acting as the traffic cop. So I hopefully that answered the question. Uh, really good question, so thank you. Um, okay, and that's all the questions I see. Um, once again, I wanted to thank everybody for attending, and uh, we've got another session coming up here in about 20 minutes, so um, thanks again, and uh, have, a, have a good rest of the event.